welcome. Uh, my name is Yanis, and I will be discussing security pitfalls when building with uh, DeFi mining Legos. Uh, so I'm an auditor. I'm working for Chain Security, and in the past uh, five years, Chain Security had had the chance to audit some of the most important blockchain protocols out there. And thanks to that, we have accumulated a lot of knowledge about common pitfalls and what can go wrong when building uh, DeFi protocols. And I want to share uh, part of this knowledge today. So let's get started. As you know, the Ethereum world is quite a complex world, right? Uh, there are numerous protocols that implement many different uh, ideas like uh, exchanges, like lending. Uh, and of course, as the time goes by, uh, the complexity uh, of these algorithms becomes more and more, uh, becomes greater. And uh, the past couple of years, we've seen that there is a new trend, if I'm allowed to say that, of protocols that aim to build on top of uh, different protocols. And they aim to take advantage of the composability capabilities that Ethereum and the smart contract technology uh, has to offer. So in the absence of a better name, I call these protocols uh, second level protocols because they take advantage of the interactions with uh, other protocols. And actually I want to focus on these uh, today and I will, pr I will try to present eight common issues or families, family of, of issues uh, that we often see. Uh, so to make things a little bit more concrete and maybe easier for you to follow, let's imagine that we want to build our own uh, second level protocol. Let's say that we want to build uh, an on-chain fund. So what is a fund? A fund is essentially a wallet, nothing special, right? It can just hold uh, assets. And for our fund, we have a manager who controls it and they're trying to increase the value of the assets that uh, the fund holds by interacting with various protocols. For example, exchanging assets uh, on Uniswap or lending or borrowing assets. Uh, and of course, we want, we want people to participate in this. So uh, we want to allow users to uh, deposit some, uh, some denomination asset and get some shares uh, of the fund. And of course, at any point, they want uh, to materialize the profits, hopefully, and sell back the shares of the funds and get uh, some part of the assets. And of course, for that, we need to be able to always know what is the, pr what is the value, the total value held uh, by our fund, and of course, what is uh, the price of uh, the shares of the fund. So, and most importantly, because we live in an adversarial world, we want to limit the actions of uh, the manager as much as possible. So that we want to prevent the manager from uh, stealing uh, funds. So what can go wrong? Actually, many things can go wrong, and we will discuss them. So first of all, we discussed that we want to be able to interact uh, with other protocols. So what does interaction uh, mean? We are essentially making calls uh, to an arbitrary address, and we pass the control of the execution to it. And of course, a smart contract can withdraw assets from our fund and can steal assets if we are not careful, right? So we want to limit uh, the possible interactions we want to allow for our funds. And for that, people have come up with this, um, with ar this architecture that it's using these uh, adapters. So what is an adapter? An adapter is a quite simple concept. Uh, it's a smart contract that sits between our fund and the external protocol. So our fund, in order to, to interact with Uniswap, let's say, must make a call to this adapter, and then this adapter will forward the call to Uniswap. So this, is, this has, oh, this has uh, many advantages. And the first one is that we limit the number of protocols we can interact with, because we, need, we always need uh, an adapter for that. And secondly, we limit uh, what calls we can make. Uh, to this protocol because we can only make as many uh, calls as the adapter allows us. So as long as we make sure that uh, our fund cannot circumvent this adapter, uh, we are certain that uh, we will not, we don't risk any funds because we know exactly what are the calls that are possible to take place. So I will insist for one more slide on this uh, adapter architecture because we see it very often in many protocols. Uh, so we're building uh, this protocol, right? We're 
people can create their own funds. And of course, we don't expect from people to deploy uh, a new adapter every time they want uh, to interact with a protocol, right? So the, all these adapters are shared among different funds. And what we want is that these adapters are, in a sense, stateless. What I mean by that is that we don't want the result the results of the interactions uh, with uh, uh, the external protocols to be dependent uh, on the order that uh, these calls to the adapters take place. Uh, another important issue that we see is that this invariant that the, the adapters are st uh, stateless breaks, and then the adapter might, might end up in a state where uh, it is not expected by the protocol. And most importantly, we've seen this many times, uh, it's not clear to the external protocol who is really who is the real investor. The adapter must make sure that uh, it tells the external protocol that it's just acting on behalf of the fund. So we don't want, for example, uh, the adapter to be seen as a staker for Curve, for example. So another issue we see very often has to do with eternal accounting. So, as I said, we are interacting with external protocols and we change the assets that we hold. And uh, at the end of the day, we need to know how much did uh, the holdings of our fund uh, change uh, with an uh, interaction. So for that, people tend to use the return values of the function, called the function calls they made. But uh, these uh, values are not always correct. A real notorious example is when you interact, for example, with Uniswap uh, version 2, you might call uh, swap exact tokens for tokens, and then Uniswap will tell you, I send an X amount back to you. But in reality, it doesn't take into account that uh, the token might have some fees. So actually, the amount that is received for our fund is, uh, is way less. And if you repeat and repeat again the same process, uh, you will end up uh, with a discrepancy in your accounting. Um, so what we suggest our clients do is instead of relying to these return values, to manually uh, get the balance of the tokens they hold by calling the balance of functions. So uh, I think this is one of my favorite attacks. We've seen it uh, many times. Um, so as I said, uh, people uh, our manager wants to trade assets. And of course, they can trade any assets they want. And for example, let's say they want to trade USDC for DAI. And let's say that we have a malicious manager who creates a malicious token. So what we would expect, independently of what path, we, uh, what path the manager specifies to trade USDC for DAI, if we forget about fees, we expect that if, I, if the manager sends 1,000 USDC, they get back 1,000 DAI. But what happens if they specify a path that contains a malicious token? Then the manager can make it look that the USDC is 1,000 times less valuable than the malicious asset. So if it, they give 1,000 USDC, then they will get one, only one malicious asset. And because they control the liquidity of this malicious asset, then they can make it look like this malicious asset is the same value as DAI. So if you give one malicious asset, then you get back only one DAI. So while we were expecting to give 1,000 and get back 1,000, in reality, we give 1,000 and we get back only one DAI. And of course, all this value is lost in this uh, thanks, to, thanks or because of this uh, malicious token. So what is really important and people forget is that at all points and after each interaction, we should be able to know how much the value of our holdings has changed. And for that, there are many different approaches, but one of them is, uh, for example, using price oracles that always query, we query them to know exactly uh, what the price of our assets. So of course, because we are security people, uh, I'm, you know, I felt obliged to mention reentrancy. Uh, so what is a reentrancy? Re reentrancy takes place when an, inter uh, an execution uh, is interrupted and another, star another one starts and then both complete successfully. And of course, uh, there are many opportunities to reenter. And this you can get, for example, when you transfer native ether or when you have some callbacks to the receiver, for example, when you transfer ERC-777 tokens. 
So what's the story for those of you who are not familiar? So for example, say that I, with, I have a malicious contract which withdraws from our fund. Then due to this withdrawal, we have a reentrance opportunity because we have a callback uh, to our contract. And then it might be that uh, the state of our fund has not been updated. Uh, so our fund is in this limbo state. So then when we re-enter again, when we call, for example, deposit, the deposit function, then we are kind of, our, our fund is, hasn't fully updated its state and the deposit function might not work correctly and this might allow us, uh, might allow the malicious contract to steal some funds. Now this is really new. Uh, actually, we have written this blog uh, and it has become quite uh, viral. So it's easy to deal with uh, the normal and very well-known reentrancy, but it's a little bit trickier to deal with this read-only reentrancy, as we call it. So for normal reentrances, you can use locks, right? And uh, people usually use these locks to prevent re-entering state-modifying functions. But what happens if we are updating, we haven't fully updated the state, but then someone tries to read the non-fully updated state. What happens then? So this is a true story, actually. So let's say we have a malicious actor, a malicious contract that uh, is interacting with a curve uh, pool. Uh, at some point, the curve pool transfers back uh, some native ether. So there is a reentrance opportunity here. The, uh, the state of the curve pool is not fully updated. And then at this point, Remember, we have the lock, so we cannot re-enter a state-modifying uh, function, but we can always read uh, the state of uh, the curve pool. And if the state is not fully updated, then based on this state, we might uh, query a value that is not correct. And this actually resulted uh, in a bug that could, uh, if we haven't prevented it, would cost like more than, I don't know, 100 million. Uh, so, Another uh, property that we want to hold, and I mentioned it at the beginning, is uh, the redeemability property. So what's that? We want people to be able to always give back their shares and take parts, part of the value of the fund. But is this always possible? For example, what happens if we want our protocol to, to allow redemption in specific tokens. What happens, for example, if we don't have, if the fund doesn't hold enough tokens to, to cover for, you know, whatever uh, I, the user asked for when they sent uh, the shares. An even more interesting property that can be violated is that the redemption is not possible because it is blocked uh, by an external protocol. For example, imagine that I, as a manager, I use all the assets of my fund to, to, as, as a collateral to take a loan. And then before I return the loan, I cannot transfer this collateral. So the property of uh, the redeemability breaks here. And this brings me to my final point, And I think this summarizes the rest of the points really well. So all the issues we faced were actually unexpected behaviors of the contracts we are interacting with. So what is really important is fully, for the developers to fully, and the auditors actually, to fully understand uh, what are the possible behaviors that can be manifested by uh, the various protocols. And for that, we encourage them to go deep down uh, the rabbit hole of each protocol. So there are many examples here. One of the most notorious is uh, the synthetic assets, which sometimes block when you want to transfer them. Or sometimes the rewards, uh, the, the claim of the rewards is not trivial. But most importantly, sometimes you are interacting with protocols that have some moving parts. They can get upgraded. And then the upgrade results in new behaviors that you don't expect. So that's it. Uh, I think I mentioned a lot. I hope you identified uh, with some of these issues if you're builders or you've seen them if you're auditors. Uh, so we discussed about how, you know, uh, how we can do the accounting correctly, how we can uh, control uh, weird execution paths, and most specifically, uh, how we need to really deeply understand uh, the protocols that uh, we are interacting with. So. 
that's it from my side. Thank you very much. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Mike two. Hello. Um, Hello. I should see a like a rabbit hole here or a pitfall where mm -hmm. a lot of the security safe practices that you mentioned mm -hmm. go against being eff efficient on the gas, right? Like checking the balances all the time and all of that crap. So very correct. Yes. Where do you draw the line? Because sorry. Where do you draw the line? Because it's it's really hard. Like you know, it's this this eternal fight on. So, it's an excellent question, and we have discussed this with our clients, actually. So me, as an auditor, I have to recommend what is correct. Now, it's up to the clients what compromises they want to do. We're here to tell them, you know, there is always this possibility for some things to go wrong. Then it's up to you what you want to do. And also, I think there have been some apes that really, EIPs, that really help, you know, reducing the gas costs with the warm addresses, for example. But yeah, uh, at the end of the day, it's up to the client to decide. And we need to recommend what is correct. More questions? All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yannis. Thank you.